Um, Karsten Prindale from Aarhus uh, was an exchange student at SciArc in 1997, um, and I was teaching there. It was the last uh, studio I taught before I became director. And uh, Karsten uh, did the wise thing and took the studio, and, and it was a great, uh, great experience. And he worked in my office for the summer of 1997, and then he went back to uh, school and finished his thesis and finished in 98, and then shortly thereafter established his office that uh, he's known for now, Zebra. And that sort of personal history, of course, gives you an idea of, of um, my background with Karsten, but also his uh, time in the U.S. and studying, and, you know, I think it was, uh, in a way, a good um, reference point, although Karsten and Zebra are Danish architects, but um, in today's world, what identity is for us, kind of nationalistically, is changing constantly. Not only are they working in, in Scandinavia, where they're way better than Big and three times Nielsen and everybody else, I think you'll see that tonight, but they're also working like a lot of people internationally uh, as well. Um, the thing that struck me about Carson, not only uh, then but now, is that on the one hand, as, a, as an architect, he comes from maybe some aspect of a humanist uh, tradition, meaning uh, you know, an environment where the social is paramount, um, where the world on the one hand is egalitarian, it's cooperative, and so forth, all the things that, that we always hope uh, a, a diverse country like ours will be. And yet that humanist tradition hasn't prevented them from, I think, playing a lot of tricks on history and, and changing uh, the rules of the game that um, maybe even architects as recent as Jakobsen uh, in Denmark uh, kind of played out. And in that sense, I think I'm going to let him tell the stories of the projects. They include um, narratives about users, uh, subversive ideas about tectonics and form and material, things that upset convention, things that play into convention, and cartoons and a lot of other things that kind of come into play. And it's a rich complexity. I'm really very honored uh, uh, to introduce him. Carson, thank you for making the long trip. Please welcome Carson Primdale. Hello, can everybody hear me? Good. Um, thanks for the nice words, Neil. It's great to be here. Uh, as Neil said, um, I've been here before uh, quite some times, but um, I did my studies here in uh, in '97, and um, it had a huge impact. It was the best learning experience I had uh, while studying, and uh, I owe that to the community of architects in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and I really appreciate being back here and uh, had the opportunity to share my ideas and uh, hopefully leave some inspiration as well. Um, <clears throat> the Sire Times, Neil, uh, that was quite interesting because um, I did go to Syrac because I wanted to have uh, you as a teacher. Actually, I was uh, looking up uh, to go to Austin, but that semester you uh, went to Syrac. And um, like the, the rest of the school, uh, most of the people signed up for your studio. So I spent half an hour in uh, Marty Rotondi's office trying to convince him why I should be at uh, Neil's studio. And he was uh, being a Buddhist, right? Uh, really calm about it, and um, <laughs> telling me that there's a lot of uh, talented uh, teachers at SciArc, and um, yeah, I might just be happy taking one of the other uh, studios. But what he didn't know was that I traveled to Los Angeles, actually, to be taught by you. So um, then he said, well, uh, and I guess that what a Buddhist does, he said, I think you should go ask me of, them, of me. So uh, when he opened the door, the whole front office was full of people. Uh, I remember there were like 20 or 30 people out there. And, he, and then the Buddhist said, Oh, are you here for Neil Denary's studio? <laughs> <laughs> I think you should go ask Neil, all of you. So we went down to the office, uh, or to the studio, uh, and we remember we stood up there, 
the door was open and um, we actually asked you and you asked the students and uh, the students accepted all of these uh, extra students into the studio and it was an amazing uh, studio because everybody uh, knew that um, we shared the time with Neil didn't have as much air time as as possible uh, during that semester, but we were there for one another, and uh, I think that um, that was the reason why uh, it was such a good experience. Uh, not only having you as a teacher, but the whole uh, the whole uh, um, atmosphere in the studio uh, between the students as well. Okay, um, enough of that. Um, I think is this is a little bit distortion here. No, it works well. Okay, good. Um, yeah. Now we're located at the epicenter of uh, the global uh, movie industry, and um, you know, we just had to do it. Um, as as Neil, Neil told you, uh, obviously, um, doing a humanistic work doesn't make you a star architect. So you have to do your own movies. Um, these guys here. Um, those are the partners of Zebra. Uh, this is Miguel. This is Kalia. This is me. Miguel goes by Mike Foxtrot. This is Killer November, and this is Charlie Papa. <laughs> um, lack of fantasy. We only can phonetic uh, abbreviations. Um, but it basically, um, it, it, it is, as, as this turns out, this poster was more of a comment. Um, in Denmark, this really pisses people off uh, because it's, it seems pretentious. Nobody gets the joke. Everybody's very serious in Denmark. Um, so that's really a way of getting some attention. Um, so what we consider ourselves would be master of the elements, um, and that would be prefab elements because that's what we work in Denmark. And um, we also mentioned that. Uh, this could be a very fun way to do a sort of like a movie uh, on ourselves. So, if this was the movie poster, this could be um, the first scene. So that's it. Let me see if I can make this work. Yeah. <laughs> now, did you see, did you see everything in that picture? I'll do it one more time because. <laughs> The most interesting thing here is actually, did you see the people? They don't even react. <laughs> it's how committed we are at our office. <laughs> the level of passion that we show. Obviously, this this is probably not shrapnel from uh, from some architecture located on the next table, but, but it could be an intern from yeah Japan who plugged in a, the computer to a 220 uh, voltage outlet. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Zebra, but before that, I'd uh, like to invite you to um, to the office, and um, then, uh, as Neil uh, said, uh, explain a little bit about the name Zebra. Uh, the office was founded uh, by the three of us in uh, 2001. We uh, worked for some larger offices in uh, in Aarhus, um, and uh, by the time. Uh, we wanted to start the office, uh, it was based out of an idea of actually uh, creating an office that had a name that was not our last names combined, but it was a sort of like a collective or team effort thing that we wanted to get into. So we dubbed the uh, office Zebra. Zebra uh, is an animal uh, that only works in crowd. They have a disguise that looks like it's a thumbprint. Each pattern on each uh, zebra is an individual pattern, uh, but it's recognized as sort of like a, a coherent pattern when it's in, a, in Hertz. Um, so what we thought about this was uh, that we wanted to create an office uh, where everybody who uh, did the projects got equally credited uh, for the work. That was one part of it. Another part of it was that it also reflected on um, our projects, that even though all the projects would be a sort of um, zebra projects, um, each of the projects would be individual projects, uh, having their own philosophy. 
uh, we were not aiming at uh, getting some kind of a dogmatic way of working where uh, we were limited to uh, one way of looking at the world, but we wanted to have the ability to change our way of looking at the circumstances and those things that actually develop the premises of a project. So thereby saying that uh, each project uh, has its own philosophy, and, um, and, uh, but they're still some, somehow uh, related because they, of course, are made by Zebra. Yeah. Um, so these uh, premises, as you see now, uh, is where we work uh, on every day. We are currently uh, around 35 people. Um, we have some interns from all over the world. We think that it gives us a lot of uh, fuel and, and um, having uh, an, an international uh, crowd. It's quite vibrant uh, when we have students from Japan meeting students from uh, Canada meeting students from Italy and so on. Um, so beyond being having an internship at our place, it's, it's also um, a personal and social experience. All right. Um, so now um, I'll get a little bit more into um, to the ideas behind uh, Zebra and, uh, and uh, our works. Um, these two guys, uh, some of you probably know them. Um, this guy is Anna Jacobson and this guy is Ian Gailey. Uh, they represent two opposites in uh, the history of Danish architecture. Uh, Adi Jacobsen, uh, most of you probably know, uh, mostly also probably from his uh, design. Um, and uh, Jan Giel, um, you probably know from um, the book Light Between uh, Buildings. They represent two uh, different ways of working with architecture. Adi Jacobsen probably represents the highly aesthetic uh, side of, of uh, creating architecture. Uh, he does beautiful design, but um, sometimes um, the people who actually use it uh, are not thought into it. But regardless, they're very, very beautiful. Most of you probably know this um, uh, chair here, which is number seven. He also did the, um, the ant. These are the buildings that he did. He was very much influenced by, by, by Mies. Uh, that's it huge precision in his work. Um, he did SAS Hotel in uh, Copenhagen and um, he also did a, a Cambridge uh, University. He was interested very much in, uh, in gardening and um, in this way he sort of had this uh, kind of a Japanese feeling to it. He actually did a lot of gardening himself but mostly it was for the visual thing. You're not supposed to be in the garden, you're supposed to look at the garden. So um, the idea of actually uh, uh, things got a little bit too, I'll, I'll just take this image here because it, it, it sort of shows everything that the idea is sort of don't get too close to nature, uh, frame it, uh, nature becomes sort of objectified and, and the buildings and the product, pro products that he did uh, were, were similar, uh, objectified. And um, so most of his buildings were very, very beautiful, but the schools that he did, for instance, um, you wouldn't call it a school today. You would, you would call it something else, uh, and, and you probably wouldn't call it a nice thing. Uh, but you, you, wouldn't, you would always agree that the stuff that he did was, was beautiful. Then on the other hand, um, we had Jan Gehl, uh, who uh, did this book in uh, 68. He's um, 68, yeah, it, it almost tells half of the story. He's, it's, it's sort of like a, out of the hippie movement. Um, uh, ideas about that cities should be for the people, should be uh, designed for the people, and uh, then he maps and started to do like vastly a vast analysis of uh, urban space to see what kind of spaces do people actually like. So this was a whole uh, reverse situation, uh, like a bottom-up 
a situation where places like sunny spots, promenades, places to have informal meetings and so on, were almost the design parameters of, of, of the city. It didn't matter what it looked like as long as people felt that this was uh, a nice uh, place to be. So you can see that these two are two uh, totally opposites. Today, Yangil is very, uh, very popular all around the world. This book is, has been widely uh, published, and it, I think it's available in 20 languages. So, and it's also probably because he uh, he uh, he talks for the people who actually uses uh, uh, the city. So, in a in a, in a way, um, you could say. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming from a social liberalistic country. This is a very social dem democratic way of looking at the world, that everybody, everything should have the same value and so on. So what's interesting about it and what's tiresome about it is that it has become a checklist of a way to do right. So this starts to sort of uh, lack contrast when you are doing things like this because it's sort of good all over uh, or medium good all over. It becomes boring instead of without contrasts. Okay, so um, these two approaches could be uh, design or humanism. It would be either Anna or Jan. Uh, what Sibra uh, does is actually trying to take the humanism and make it driving, be a driver for the design. So it's actually uh, an Anna and a Jan at the same time. It's a difficult way to come around things, uh, but it's our agenda and we strive most to sort of to, to get there. But as I said earlier on, um, as the zebras are uh, individual but, but has some resemblance, projects are based on certain circumstance and each project has a philosophy of its own and each philosophy causes an architectural concept. Which means that we are like virgins at our office. Uh, we try to look at the world in a new way every time we meet it in a new project from its own conditions instead of trying to put a, um, a single philosophy onto uh, the project. Uh, and that's what I want to show you tonight, uh, to just show some projects that sort of tell the story, instead of uh, tell, uh, talk too much about this. Um, so I've been thinking what to do. Uh, either should I take a broad sweep and show a lot of projects, or should I just take a few and go into, uh, into depth with those? I did a combination, so the first of them is just a, for referential uh, work, so you can see some of what we're doing, and then I'll dive into uh, projects where we head into the details as well. Okay, um, let's rock. This is a, a black slide, yeah. Uh, maybe some of you know um, a festival called Roskilde Festival in Denmark. It's an annual event. It hosts 90,000 people uh, in a week. Uh, in that week, it's the fifth largest city in Denmark. Uh, but it's also the densest place in the world. It takes a huge effort to, uh, to plan this event because it's urban planning for a short while, but it's also an urban lab. Um, the, um, the group that actually runs this show uh, is only 60 people uh, strong through the year, but volunteers show up uh, before this event, and then the, um, the uh, service people are 30,000 people. There's 90,000 people attending uh, this event, of course, as I told you, but it's an organization that is only 60 people, and then all of a sudden 30,000 people. So it has to accommodate a lot of um, a lot of growth all of a sudden, and uh, they want to have a headquarter that were uh, open and inviting all these people. So uh, what you see here is um, is uh, what they call musicon. Roskilde is, uh, is 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 located outside the Copenhagen, and. Um, uh, they, this is sort of the brand because of urbanization. A lot of people actually move to Copenhagen, but this thing keeps the people uh, in uh, in Roskilde. So they up this uh, project, Musicon. Actually, it's called Musicon Valley uh, for starters. Uh, it was an 
old country factory was called, was called uh, Unicon. So that was the, re the reason why it was named Musicon. So uh, the Musicon Valley uh, consists of a rock museum uh, and also this uh, um, uh, office building for the Roskilde Group. And uh, it also has uh, music schools and so on. So it's a whole uh, campus of, of uh, music related uh, activities. Here you have the festival uh, area. And uh, this is just a short diagram to show that the uh, main access here uh, goes through a worn out uh, um, space uh, formerly used for, um, for the country factory. And uh, this is uh, the, um, the rock museum. And basically, what they wanted to were, were to give all these volunteers access to the heart of the building, but without going into the the, uh, the chamber of the lion where they have the most uh, secret thing, the, the bookers for uh, the concerts. So, in some way, they wanted the, the democratic uh, qualities of the atrium, but on the other side, they wanted to have uh, it open while an atrium is inverted or introvert. The um, the um, atrium in this incident should be an extrovert thing. So that was the reason for um, for what you're going to see now is going to be uh, the concept. Uh, here you access through uh, the, um, the building uh, that was formerly an industrial uh, warehouse. And here's one of the concepts that came out of uh, the model studies. And here's the diagram that shows uh, the model. Uh, so actually, instead of having an introvert um, atrium here, the, uh, the atrium or the open space is set aside, and then you have the plan. Each this, these are two plans, and then it's rotated around a single core, and then it allows uh, views uh, to different sides that are views that are views to um, to Roskilde, views to the festival plus, and so on. And all the people who are actually working there as volunteers would be visu visually connected to the outside. Those areas that are more closed are the more sort of private uh, functions in the building. And um, basically the plan layout is like this. So you can see here is a, a traditional flexible office space. Here's a, an open space right connected to it. This is a void and this is a, the stair coming up. And here's a stair leading up to the next uh, floor. And uh, this is the core that is uh, running through all the building. And here you see the double height functions of oh, areas here. So they are rotated in pairs. Okay. So uh, this is uh, the uh, icon of uh, the Roskiller Festival, this tent. And it's also their logo. Uh, and that logo will be uh, integrated into the facades that you can see here. So actually, this is the unfolded facade. So, so uh, the whole promenade uh, up uh, in the building um, uh, is displayed uh, with these arches that uh, resembles uh, the main stage. All right. Uh, next one I'm going to run through very quickly it was a big commission that we won uh, two years ago. It was an experimentarium. It's sort of an infotainment center where you have sciences uh, installed in a black space uh, where you can get a one-on-one -on -one experience by, uh, by actually doing something uh, actively uh, with the installation. Mostly it's for kids, for public schools and so on, but it um, displays physical uh, phenomena in a very interesting way. Today, uh, it's a, this is a, a retrofitting of a building mm -hmm. where we add a new building uh, onto it. It's approximately 30,000 square meters. Uh, that would be, is that 300,000 square feet or less? Yeah. Um, so this building is located at a former brewery uh, area to go north, north of Copenhagen. Um, it used to be an introvert function as well. Uh, so uh, this is actually also the only uh, public function in that area. All of the other buildings here are office uh, buildings. It's going to be one of the uh, flagships for um, cultural, uh, uh, one of the cultural flagships in Copenhagen. So it needs to be made very visible. Um, so today you have this situation here. 
everything is located inside uh, the big spaces, and it actually doesn't tell a story about the building's function. So what we wanted to do was to take each of these functions and drag them onto the outside, so there would be some kind of display uh, facing the different uh, urban spaces uh, located around the building. And this is what you can see here. Actually, the, the uh, first uh, concept of the um, competition winning project was a totally triangulated project. It was based on the same concept, but the foundation that actually sponsored the money wanted to look a little bit more, um, let's say, timeless. That's what they asked for. We don't know what timeless means in a sense, but actually it has something to do with boxes, boxes obviously. So we had to do a, a reiterate on, on this project uh, um, a whole lot, but um, uh, we are getting there. But then uh, you can see this is a uh, concept for how we dealt with the organization of uh, the spaces. So we have this huge space here. So this is actually a pretty stupid and simple concept, just uh, inserting two galleries with two circulations here. So here you have an interest situation where you have all the public uh, functions. You really want to have the public coming into the building. This is the exhibition space. It's basically sort of like a black space. It needs to have, uh, to have the temporary installations uh, inside it. And this is uh, also an exhibition space, but it also uh, uh, office space. So here you see uh, some of the plans, big open spaces. And then there's uh, the roof terrace as well. I'll get to this section here because that tells the story about uh, the entrance situation, which is actually uh, one of the key parameters in uh, the design. This is a double helix uh, staircase, and uh, one axis here is for paying customers, and the other axis is for non-paying customers. So those uh, those who get into the non-paying customers are only allowed to get to these two kind of spaces. This is the cafe and uh, the conference area. While this is uh, the temporary exhibition, uh, there you have uh, the paying customers getting in as well as, as, as here. So that's basically uh, the design concept for the main stair uh, in this space here. Then you have also a gallery here, which is made out of a straight uh, staircases. It's more like a vector space. Um, this is showing the sort of like the organic part of science. This is showing uh, the more sort of uh, mathematical, uh, mechanical uh, part of science. Um, both experiences are related to some of the installations that are located uh, right next to them. So this is uh, the space you enter when you get into um, uh, uh, the front gallery. And uh, as you can see, um, one, one uh, access to stairs is here, and one, one is here. And this is from the first floor. Uh, these stairs, um, obviously, you can see that you have uh, some recess here. The column is only like 30 centimeters behind uh, uh, the front of the floor slab here. Here is several meters, and here it comes out again. Uh, so you can see there's a different width. Uh, in the space, and also there's, al there's alternating heights uh, uh, at the different floors. So that means that you have to work uh, in a way where you actually um, use uh, we use Grasshopper for for um, for scripting uh, the right geometries uh, for this. It's really a complex uh, stair. This guy you just saw here was uh, the spores, the spores, a younger uh, grandson who's telling about um, the um, uh, the double helix uh, in uh, natural sciences. So the spore is um, the guy who uh, did the quantum uh, mechanics, and uh, we're currently working on uh, some of the um, working on the facades. Uh, this thing you can see here. Those are actually like, um, um, what do you call them? Uh, got the word. It's like a brisolet. What do you call it? Louvres? Yeah, louvres. Right. Vertical louvres mm -hmm. that are cut from the inside, so you actually get the contour. It's not an image that is a sort of a, a, 
uh, painted onto uh, the surface, it's, it's cut from the inside, so that it will actually also when you move around uh, the building. This is uh, the uh, roof terrace, uh, this is the front entrance as it is right now. Yeah, And uh, all of these um, larger parts of the building is going to have some, uh, have some uh, figures on it. Okay, so now we are heading into something uh, that uh, is sort of like um, some of the core uh, core competences that uh, Zebra has. We have been doing a lot of schools and uh, working a lot of, with uh, the educational system. This project is called the Agora. Um, it's basically Greek for a uh, for big open plaza. But it's also um, a place where people meet and uh, interact and exchange a lot of knowledge. The Agora is a, an adult educational center and uh, it is a program to sort of re-educate people who already has an education or dropped out of a college uh, or if um, you have people who uh, had learning disabilities can come there and uh, strengthen <coughs> the, the, the education. Um, this concept uh, sort of uh, splits uh, the project into uh, two ways of uh, looking at the, an educational building. In Denmark we do a lot of uh, competitions that are based on tenders, so you have the contract already from the start, which is uh, giving a prize at the same time while you're drawing it. So basically all these projects are low cost uh, projects. Um, so therefore, this project uh, consists of a part which is sort of a rigid, rational part. Uh, this is where we have the generic spaces, the flexible spaces. And then it also consists of a, a part which is a supplement to uh, the more uh, general spaces, which is for the individual uh, preferences. Some of you probably know uh, a lot about um, the theories from uh, Don and Don and, uh, and uh, Gardner uh, with regards to learning styles and uh, uh, the seven intelligences. This is basically what, what this work is based on. Um, I'll get into that. This is uh, how we address the building uh, when we look from outside. The building allowed 12,500 square meters to be built on site, and the whole program was 12,500. 12, so we couldn't give more space or, or more floor areas uh, to uh, the client. Uh, so we actually mm -hmm. all, almost had to extrude the whole building uh, from uh, the side perimeters. Therefore, we have this shape um, here, and we cut out uh, these uh, openings. This one facing the south, uh, south uh, eastern corner where you had the sun coming around. This would be uh, the entrance of the building. This one cut out is, is uh, for a terrace facing the harbor side, and this is uh, a terrace facing the city side. So. By doing this, uh, we cut out some, some area from uh, the different floors, which allowed us to get into the right amount of square meters. And here you can see uh, the southeastern corner, where we located the cafe. We're coming around. This is a cafe that sort of allows people to sort of get into uh, the, um, the building just without, without having an area uh, as well. Uh, it's currently an ongoing project. It's getting built right now. Um, they're closing the facades, and here you see uh, the uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a site visit uh, that we did uh, in the middle of uh, December. These are the plans. We did something um, that was a little bit uh, against the program. In the program, they wanted all the uh, science facilities right underneath the roof because of the technical installations. Instead of that, we put them onto first floor. Uh, all the uh, extra functions of the, the cultural music, uh, arts, and so on, we put on the ground level, uh, creating an atmosphere of in interchange, uh, having all of the functions sort of um, uh, sort of uh, leading out into this open space here, where we also had the cafe. The cafe is here. And then we also have the uh, administration and so on. So this became a science level, and this became cultural level, and this area up here is more like the generic uh, classrooms. And in this way, um, we achieved a building 
that was very much uh, crowded and, and active in the bottom here. And the more you get up into uh, the building, the less people and more quiet it would become. Here you can actually see uh, these different plans that I showed you before, uh, superimposed. Um, it's basically a squared framework where you have uh, these ovals cutting through diagonally, like this, like uh, the shape of eight. Here you go. And that means they are overlapping. You create spaces that are single height, double height, triple height, quadruple height. And uh, you get a section that gets a lot of uh, light coming uh, down from the top. And also it brings shade into uh, the building and reflection as well. So having both one, one uh, floor heights, two floor heights, three floor heights combined into this overall space gives different kinds of uh, scale, different kinds of light conditions, different kinds of sound conditions as well. So it's actually not just a, um, a um, in-between space, it's a 100% it's supplement to uh, the classroom space. This is where the, the kids go when they're working in, in groups, when they're working individually, um, and this is where you can actually find a place that, that uh, fits your way of working. Most of you probably know that um, some like to sit in front of a big window when they are working, some like to, to sit near a candle, some want completely quiet, and some like a little noise or music in the background and so on. So this space actually accommodates that. And here you can see uh, some of uh, the images from uh, the construction site, uh, the overlapping of, uh, of the three floors here. You can see how uh, the, um, the skylight sort of seeps down into, uh, into, into the ground floor. Um, this is actually the ground floor. You can see this is first floor, second floor, third floor. And here's the section. So the more you get up towards the skylight, the more the light will come from the top. And the view here will face upwards. The more you get to the bottom, the more transparent the facade is. And it will connect to the outside, letting people in uh, and inviting them for those cultural uh, things going on uh, at ground level. And here you can actually see um, the light coming from the ground level and entering from the street. It's opening, there's a visual connection from the street, so those activities going on at ground level, cultural activities, are also promoting uh, the light in the building. And here you have uh, this, the light from uh, four floors above uh, coming down to uh, the ground level. This is uh, a view from the uh, first floor. And uh, here you also can see uh, uh, this sort of like cathedral-like uh, pillars coming up. Some of them are three stories high. There's no no uh, columns actually touching the roof, the roof inside this uh, agora. They only carry uh, the floor plates, which means that when you're on the top floor, uh, you have a, a totally open uh, space, and you can look down into these sort of like overlapping coins. It has some kind of um, similarity to uh, Mario Bros. computer game where you're actually jumping from uh, platform to platform. Um, and as you can see uh, here, you have here this is the uh, first floor, second floor, third floor, and that's, that's the roof. So there's a lot of different uh, spatial conditions inside this usually uh, just flow area, but, but now it's programmed as a common area, a collective area, uh, where you can actually work in groups or individually. So um, <clears throat> this thing we have here, um, that's the main stair. The idea was to, um, was to say that uh, the whole building is, is, is white. Uh, this way we would uh, experience the light conditions and uh, the scale uh, much better the change from uh, lit faces to uh, faces in shade. Um, and then all those uh, furniture, super furniture, uh, are places where you got in touch and touched 
the building would be in wood, uh, sort of like a warm uh, material. Um, we uh, had a conversation with the client about this uh, because a totally white building um, is probably only something that uh, an architect would, would, would think is a, a cool thing. Uh, so we had really to make an, an, an illustration of, of, of why we wanted that. So we did um, a drawing of uh, Linus de Mille as a, as a tart, is that what you call it? Well, a woman with a lot of uh, makeup. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we had this totally white uh, sculpture on one hand, and then we just put on makeup on her. And they got the point immediately, just like that. Um, so it, 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 it actually is very convincing when, when, when uh, and some, somehow also very sort of uh, manipulating, but, but they got the whole uh, idea of the building by actually just telling that story. Uh, so the building is is actually uh, thought of as, as being a canvas, and all those uh, elements that comes in of furniture, they had to uh, bring in a lot of uh, old furniture as well. So instead of trying to make it look good and paint it, we, we wanted them to go into vintage uh, shops and buy a new, more old furniture, and actually make sort of sm smaller uh, tableaus. Uh, uh, maybe uh, an IKEA tableau, or maybe a 70s tableau, or something like that, in order to sort of give give uh, it an identity. So it would be sort of like a canvas, a background, and then they could by themselves actually sort of uh, paint on it. Uh, we wouldn't want to sort of um, uh, be um, in control of that. Okay, so um, this is actually uh, this is inside the stairs. Um, there's a restroom here, and um, this is the stair case. Uh, as you saw, originally it was sort of like a cone. Um, we found out that there was a new legislation with regards to uh, the platform and rises, so it became more big. So eventually it was like uh, 200 uh, square meters, 2,000 feet uh, footprint for a, chair, for a, for, um, a staircase. Uh, so of course we had to to, uh, to to do some maneuvers in order to uh, to uh, reduce that size. So what we did was actually um, cut, make it make it make it bigger, but but then cut out uh, some volumes of it. So this one is is, is a sphere that is cut out of a staircase. It is located underneath the floor plate, so you cannot use uh, it to sit on it anyways. So the sphere actually sort of. It's usable here to sit on here, but then it gets steeper and steeper and steeper, so you can only use it as a shelf. Here it's cut in by a cylinder and gives access to uh, to uh, the restrooms. Here you can see there's a cylinder cut into it. This is an amphi uh, stage as well, and these are the stairs leading up to the first floor. So uh, it starts to uh, be more and more programmed and incorporate. Uh, um, the space around it as a context. And this is uh, the final image of, um, of the project. As I told, told you, uh, we are masters of, of, of prefab elements. There's a reason for that. Uh, the climate in Denmark um, is uh, a very sort of a changing uh, environment. Uh, we have, when it's really hot in summer, we have um, something like 25 degrees, maybe 30 degrees. Celsius when it's really cold, we have, have, have minus 15 or even sometimes down to minus 25. So it's a huge gap, which means also you cannot uh, pour concrete uh, in winter time. So therefore, uh, they usually um, cast uh, prefab elements during winter time and then you build in springtime. Working with prefab elements is basically like working with Lego. Uh, that's also from our country, and I guess that's probably also the reason why we do the prefab element. Another thing is that it's the contractors who usually own the uh, factories that do the prefab uh, elements. So they have a natural interest in actually giving the lowest prices for these things. So they also get a double profit into it. So as an architect in Denmark, you have to learn uh, to work with prefab elements, even though it has a lot of limitations. Uh, it also allows uh, a construction cost that is 
is quite low. This con construction cost for this building is, is 8,500 pounds. That is uh, similar to uh, 1.4, 1,400 dollars or so. I guess that's pretty, pretty cheap in per, per, meter. per square meter. Yeah. So how much would that be in, uh, in the States? Is it? Is, is that fairly cheap? Yeah, it is. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah. And needless to, the, the, the contract went bankrupt, but it wasn't our fault. It was due to some other <laughs> other projects actually. Uh, but as you can see, this this building you don't build for forty forty dollars per, per, per square feet actually. Um, so another thing that we had to do is that, is that we need to do and play some tricks. So as you saw in the beginning, the overall framework is very 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 rigid. It's it's even more low cost. So what actually costs in the, in, 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 in this project is uh, the agora where you have the overlapping um, circles. It's inside the climate screen, uh, so uh, there's no uh, technical uh, difficulties in doing that. Uh, so that means that we don't have an expressive building outside. The building outside actually just follows uh, the site parameter because of the program that was given. But what we try to do here is actually uh, doing a trick again. So uh, we remove the idea of uh, the element, uh, the prefab element. So as you can see here, we have floor heights here uh, that are four meters. And we have a floor slab with a suspended ceiling that is one meter. So this gives us three meters internal room height. But it gives us a possibility of making uh, panels that are two by one on the outside. By introducing this panel here, we get the possibility of, um, of uh, sort of um, distorting the lines of, uh, of uh, the windows. So it becomes like one volume and one big carpet instead. And uh, of course, that during nighttime, if we didn't have these panels, you would only see uh, these uh, windows lighted. So the idea is that we hook this up to um, to uh, the CTS system, and it's a program. So when you go and enter a room uh, and put on the light, the panels on the outside will also uh, light up and then fade out. So the building becomes somehow transparent. Um, so you can see that this is a, a panel made of the expanded uh, metal. Uh, in this one here, we have a composite uh, video uh, LED strip on this side, and um, it allows uh, us to sort of make a fade and make um, the facade uh, alter uh, in accordance to the activity on the inside. Okay, um, next project here. Um, sort of a funny project. It's also uh, uh, something that has to do uh, with education. The ECEC is uh, Early Childhood Educational Center. It's in Abu Dhabi. It's uh, our first and uh, no limit budget project. Um, nice to have that one finally. Um, uh, it's really interesting. Uh, because uh, the commissioner here is a princess. Uh, she's uh, the granddaughter of El Sayed, who uh, founded the Emirates uh, in 71. They struck oil in 74, and uh, he found that it was a pretty nice idea to, to make a, sort of a, a union of uh, the city-states instead of uh, disagreeing and rather agreeing. And, um, and uh, he was very... Uh, uh, good at looking ahead at that time. So what is interesting now is that this is third generation since they struck oil. The first generation uh, was their dad. And you probably, uh, of parents, as you, you probably know some of the architecture. I've seen some of it. It's very, um, it's, what, 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 what would you call it? Um, a little bit taggy, maybe, you would say. Um, we went to the guest house after the interview. They had gold on the walls, on the ceilings, 
solid gold in the railings. It was a, sort of like a, a total display of, uh, of, 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 of richness. Um, these girls are third generation, they've always been rich. They're much more into the content right now. They don't want to have these um, displays of wealth anymore because it doesn't give them any more. They're already so rich that now content is what they're aiming for. This is the condition and, and therefore um, it's also interesting that, uh, that the women in, uh, in the Emirates are now more and more getting into uh, the job market. And therefore they leave home. There's nobody to take care of the kids. Usually you have had nannies from India that weren't <coughs> educated. Now they know that uh, the first years after you were born are very, very important years. So they want to have educated staff to do that. So this early childhood education center is actually the first project of its kind uh, in uh, the Emirates. It's partially a daycare institution, and it's partially an educational facility. And it's also combined with a reason function, of course. Um, so, when we went in an interview, we sort of um, put a, a large emphasis on, uh, on the SDDAM, that's the word for sustainability. Uh, in short, their way of looking at uh, sustainability is um, harmony between man and nature. It's not broken into social or economical and or environmental uh, sustainability. It's just harmony between man and nature. So when we had the interview, we, we did some uh, preparations, initial preparations for, for understanding Estidama. And one thing that we sort of uh, found was that uh, architecture and food uh, were the cultural vessels that actually sort of uh, um, allowed them to, to, to live in the desert. The architecture made them uh, made them capable of living in this hostile environment, and the food that were given from the, the ground, the dates and the fishes, fish were the only thing that actually actually had, had besides the pearl they used for trading. Today, uh, the Emirati uh, is a um, what would you call it uh, has lost a lot of identity. Uh, it's a, it has been vastly uh, westernized. They have imported a large amount of buildings that are glass skyscrapers that sort of uh, are icons bring, brought in from the modern world and placed into the desert. It costs a lot to run these uh, buildings with regards to energy and so on. And it doesn't uh, uh, relate to, uh, to the local culture at all. So uh, what we did was to, uh, to start out uh, doing some um, um, investigations. First off, I'm not going to tire you with this. This is just uh, the program laid out. Uh, actually, what we bid for was doing the whole thing. Uh, we didn't know. We obviously, we usually get a program for building, but, but just getting a question is much, much better. But we didn't know that we also had to do it for the same salary. So we had to start from scratch, uh, you know, uh, work out the, uh, the floor area program, describe each function, and so on. So this is basically it. Um, and uh, we also have Yale on the side here as a, as a, uh, as a consultant, and they're doing a really good job. Um, so basically, this is um, uh, what you have in the, the classrooms. And this, this, this pink thing is uh, the teacher's room. This is the site here. And uh, these are amenities uh, such as uh, auditoriums and so on, um, as that facilities. As you already can see here, you can see you need to build in, in several stories in order to fit it into this side here. Um, when you're doing uh, facilities for kids, you can only have them on the first floor because of fire regulations. So you can almost see the problem coming up uh, already. Uh, we did some uh, studies of different uh, organizations, and the one that we ended up with was actually uh, a hybrid but uh, it is sort of uh, like uh, the courtyard uh, building. Uh, the atrium would be the one that would be the most square meter efficient and could be fitting on the side. Some of these hybrids uh, that were in between uh, the atrium and uh, the star models could also fit on the side. But the one that sort of suited the program the best, the, the atrium, 
couldn't fit on the site. Um, we did these uh, findings of uh, cultural anchors. Um, let me see, what time is, what time is uh, how am I doing here? I'm okay. Yeah, half an hour? So? Half an hour now? Yeah? Max, okay, all right. <laughs> Keep it short. This is the Waha. The Waha means the oasis. It's, um, you know it, it's, 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 it's also like the image of uh, of um, fertile soil, uh, water where there's no water in, in the middle of the desert. Uh, it's 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 an image of uh, growth. This is um, the Barajil. Some of you probably know it. It's, it's a wind tower. It's a way of trapping uh, the wind and bringing it down, uh, and it allows uh, to cool uh, uh, the spaces underneath. It's, it's, it's usually placed uh, inside uh, this type of building, which is uh, the Beit al Sahel, which is the Coast People's Home. Uh, the Coast People's Home is uh, fenced by uh, uh, the st we call it stalks from uh, the pine leaf, uh, uh, palm leaves. Uh, it's a very durable material. Uh, this material lasts for 50 years or so. Then you have these small buildings surrounding um, the courtyard. They yeah, usually have sort of like a big tree in the middle the only type of tree that actually grows there, uh, to bring shade into the center of, uh, of the courtyard here. And then you have Arrimal, uh, the different kind of dunes, I think, that like Eskimos, they have different names for all of these uh, configurations uh, in the desert. So some of these uh, images um, from their culture, we try to bring in as cultural anchors, but also trying to use uh, these type of organization in order to uh, create an architecture that are working with uh, the conditions rather than against the conditions. So this is basically a low-tech solution uh, for, uh, for, for a sustainable way of uh, dealing uh, with the program. Trying to use those uh, mechanisms when they were living in tents and, and taking them into a modern interpretation. Okay, so um, as you can see, this is uh, the Coast People's Home. They, the courtyard is split up into four. Here uh, it still has the um, the uh, tree inside. It has the tent-like uh, figures. Uh, it has a center building. It has different parts located uh, uh, in each uh, arm here. This is uh, the Arrimal, the do. Here it is a stack program. You can see the largest program with the parts where you have the classrooms uh, below uh, and on first floor. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, ground floor with direct access to the outside. Then you have staff facilities and amenities on top of that. Um, yeah, this one here is uh, the Oasis, the Oasis Al-Baha, which is uh, probably the one that sort of uh, makes the largest contrast of, uh, between inside and outside. I would say, like in Los Angeles, uh, the outside is um, the, the car's uh, space. Um, in, the, in the Abu Dhabi, the reason is that the climate is extreme, it's 45 degrees centigrade uh, most of the year, which means that you, you don't go outside. You just go directly into the car and then you go and drive. So you don't have uh, possibilities of staying in the outside space only during the winter time or during the late night. But as you can see, uh, the Waha is uh, way too big uh, for, the, for the site, but it is the best solution for the program, so we took it in anyways. Here is um, ways of actually dealing with the, um, uh, the Waha. You can see here we go to the extent of the side and uh, we cut out some holes here and allow daylight into the space here. So um, we bought these uh, different models. There was actually a few more to a meeting with the princesses and uh, I think that they told us actually that, that, that they often went to Harrods, um, and I think that um, the way of looking at architecture was sort of like they were saying, oh, "We like this from this one, and we'd like to have that color from that one, and the size of that one, and the program from that one." Obviously, it, it, it's sort of a nightmare for an architect to, to sort of uh, try to make things meet that doesn't uh, go together. Uh, but we tried, and. Uh, 
we arrived at a solution where we actually got some of the elements uh, working together and integrated them into a, a building. So, um, so here you can see, uh, here's some of uh, the tent-like qualities. Here's, uh, here's uh, um, the wind towers. Um, and here are the uh, courtyards, the oasis. This is uh, the other view of uh, Okay, so basically, um, the building is organized in two, uh, in two uh, stories. There's two uh, stories underground for parking as well. And there's, then there's a roof, uh, roof garden. Um, here you have one part. Here you have one part. One part. And here you have auditorium and uh, and uh, retail functions. Up here you have the educational center. Before it was located inside and next to the classroom. Now we moved it upside, uh, up, up upstairs, and integrated into a large educational facility that actually has a view. Uh, to the classrooms through these uh, windows here. So here you can see uh, the diagrams. It's a, um, it's a um, decade institution from zero years to five years old kids. These are the outdoor spaces. These are the spaces that are located right next to, um, to the classrooms. All of the classrooms has large openings facing this direction, but are almost closed towards the outside. It's like the tent, which is very introvert, and it's covered with a wave, veil, uh, and then it's, it, it's, it faces uh, the, the, the center of the oasis. Upstairs, we have a similar uh, uh, organization. This is uh, the kindergarten teachers workspace, they, can have a, they have a view down to the classrooms while they can work in teams and uh, prepare uh, um, the day. Okay, this is a geometric drawings, I'm just going to run up through these ones here. Here you see the uh, floor plans, the parts here, play area, And the upstairs. So this space here is uh, is where you actually can enter the building. Get upstairs here, and uh, it has facilities for uh, for the parents as well. And this is a uh, the roof garden. Okay. So that final shape uh, looks like this, and um, it is generated uh, with spheres that are sort of um, as a Boolean, uh, um, what do you call it, Boolean subtraction from, from the volume. Uh, what you can see here is uh, the column of water. So the sphere is placed, so the water actually runs off uh, the roof. It only rains three days, a, three days a year, but they have the same regulations as we have uh, in Northern Europe with regards to water. So we solve it in, in this way, so we don't have any uh, like, Big visible system for uh, for uh, for the rainwater. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is um, the roofscape, and here you can actually see the, uh, the roof garden as well. It's like the tent uh, is sort of lifted here, so you see you get a facade, which actually make you uh, uh, it's possible to access the roof garden. This is uh, the facade. It's, um, it's going to be made out of blue, of, of, of a kind of alloy. Uh, it has a kind of a bronze uh, feeling to it. Um, they have these windows, which are like a circle that is cut, so it can actually open. And it's, it's, uh, these windows actually have uh, the louvers mounted on them where you have the fire escapes. These are the facades. Um, this is the rounding fence. This is a transformer station, and inside here, you can actually see uh, these trees that bring shade into um, to the center of uh, the building. And here you see the uh, roof terrace again. Okay. 
as you can see here, um, this is just uh, the new rope that we have played it with. Uh, it's just deeper here, and not so deep here. Here you can see a little bit of the concrete behind it. And um, all of them sort of have this shape with the part of the circle going down, so it has a lot of resemblance to, uh, to uh, the image of um, the desert. And uh, the entrance here, of course, uh, to the entrance of the tent. This is uh, the interior of the, the courtyards. Ground level, where you can actually see these trees on the outside. It's uh, cast concrete here, exposed. And this is sort of, sort of like a, a roof that is suspended. It's almost like playing cards uh, hanging from the roof. This is an uh, from upstairs. This is a model that we did on the, the classrooms. Uh, the classrooms are here. They have an extreme height up here, so this has allowed us to, um, to have all the, uh, the mechanical stuff, the AVAC. Uh, but it also gives us an opportunity not to have a sprinkling system underneath the roof uh, uh, where we have the exposed concrete. And you can see that um, we integrate small nooks underneath the stairs here. Uh, windows in all heights. And you can see there's a huge connection between um, the interior of this space and the outside here. So actually, it's a very introverted building. Uh, there's nothing to see on the outside, but there's a lot to see on the inside. It's like children universe. And here you see the courtyard. Even though this is uh, the outdoor space here, here, and here. Um, it's conceived or considered as being one big surface that extends through the uh, windows. And uh, all those uh, small spots you see on the, on the plan are, are different um, uh, surfaces, uh, materials, uh, functions that are integrated into one uh, coherent whole uh, of a landscape. Then there's the trees. The trees are um, a way of integrating green into uh, the playground. Uh, without having it at ground level, we're actually lifting the green up and allowing as much space uh, underneath and then still having green uh, in the area. Uh, another thing that the, uh, this uh, super tree does is that it actually is the barajil, uh, the wind tower, as you see here. And that is incorporated into the shape of, uh, of uh, <coughs> the tree. So, and this is actually more or less right, you can see the scale here, it's a really big tree. Uh, it, uh, we worked out it with a, sort of a parametric design, so um, it, it is also uh, created in, uh, in relationship to the sun's um, path over the sky. So it uh, brings shade into uh, to the courtyard and uh, leaves big glass partitions uh, in, in shadow. Um, it also uh, uh, incorporates a lot of functions, as you can see here. Um, we have a cave inside it, we have a, a slide, we have a water area, there's music coming out of it, and then there's, I think there's a guy here, wrote steam, but I think it's just mist, actually. Um, slings and so on. A lot of, it's a play, play tree, actually. And they look like this. Like this section. Here you can see that we build a lot of models. Um, this one was for a wind study. Uh, this is, um, I don't know what you call it, it's sort of like a flower, this uh, granola kind of thing. When you put it out here and then you, uh, you put it into a, a wind tunnel, it seems like a pretty uh, crude way of uh, doing this, uh, but it actually works. We didn't do it, we went to a lab uh, and these tests done. So we're actually checking whether um, this system works, and as you can see, it actually accelerates uh, the wind uh, when it comes out uh, down here. You can measure that uh, from the distance between the hole here and the, and the flower. Yeah. Okay. Um,
All right, this is a project, a collaborative project that we did with the three other young officers, um, uh, Julian Smith and uh, Sibra, sort of like in-house architects uh, for this uh, developer, Jan Tegger, who came up with the idea of uh, actually doing a collaborative project for young uh, architects. Originally, we were supposed to do uh, sort of like four buildings on this side, uh, but we ended up doing uh, one uh, big building that had elements of each uh, office integrated into it. Um, <clears throat> it's located at the hub front of Aarhus, right here, the first stage. Uh, Aarhus is like uh, a lot of other larger cities in Denmark, located at the sea, where you have the crossing between uh, fresh water and uh, salt water, salt water being the, the waste of the sea, and the fresh water uh, for, uh, for drinking. So those were the reasons why Aarhus was uh, established uh, this place. Um, the, uh, the harbor front uh, has been reclaimed, uh, so the whole part here is, has now become uh, the new uh, city front. Uh, before it was industry, uh, now it's going to be a totally new uh, city core. Uh, still, uh, a lot of those functions uh, that are usually in, uh, in the harbor is, uh, are up and running. Uh, the crane, the scales of the cranes are big. Uh, container ships and so on uh, are still there. Uh, so there's a big scale to play with, uh, but you also have to work with an intimate scale for those people who want to live there. The original uh, master plan uh, was uh, made out of um, these city blocks with courtyards. Uh, the idea was that it was tallest to the center of, uh, of uh, the master plan, and then it, it gradually uh, became lower and lower towards uh, the uh, edge of the harbor. It would have been uh, something that looked like this if you looked from uh, the outside and, and coming to uh, the, uh, the city, you've seen the first uh, facade of houses and then blocking uh, behind uh, the next row of houses as well. So one thing that we did was, uh, in order to make this sort of a, a, city, a livable city park, was to integrate uh, streetscape having three uh, streets running through uh, the structure. Um, besides that, uh, we opened uh, the streets so they are facing east and uh, west. So when it's in south, they're sort of in shade for one another. But they are there when you are at home, not working, uh, in the morning and the, in the evening. It also prevents the overheating uh, as well. And here you can see uh, the openings uh, as well. Then uh, we introduced um, these uh, shots, the peaks um, uh, in the project. Uh, this allowed us to, uh, to introduce a view for, for all of uh, the buildings, or at, not at least, it, it, it also made a different uh, shadow pattern that actually um, uh, gave more uh, daylight uh, in the streets as well. So now we have uh, what we call deep skyline. Uh, when you look from, um, from uh, the outside, you don't see the front facade, but you see a lot of facades and a lot of facets uh, of the building. Before you had a view that was sort of uh, cut off by the front row of, um, of the courtyard here. Now we have access from uh, the inside. You can walk onto a balcony. Uh, some of those buildings that are actually on top uh, have direct views to, uh, to a big uh, ocean uh, or big ocean views. As you can see here, they are offset, uh, which means that when you have a valley here, you have a peak here, and you have a valley here. So this allows this apartment to have a view uh, to the ocean side here as well. Um, and not, not, not only that, there's a building going to be behind it. It also gets an ocean view. So this is about sort of uh, working outside the immediate context also bringing qualities to the neighboring buildings as well. What is interesting is that uh, what you saw uh, firstly, it was six and seven story high building. This is actually 12 and 13 story high building. The municipality allowed this because this worked with the intentions of the master plan. Didn't follow the rules, but they thought that this was more suitable because it actually did more uh, than the original scheme. So they actually changed the rules uh, and the, the, the regulating uh, uh, 
material uh, when we did this. So here you can see that um, it's tallest to the back here, and then it gradually becomes lower and lower to, uh, towards the ocean side here. This would have been the view from the top floor uh, if it was a courtyard. And this is uh, the view uh, when it's when you have the valleys uh, in front of the in front of the uh, peaks. This is uh, the shadow panel, as you can see. Um, this gives a long, unbroken line of shadow that moves during the day like this, where you have spots here, which means that the outdoor space, even though we have a higher building, have uh, spots of sunlight coming into it. And here you can see the shadow in the backside. Well. <coughs> These uh, renderings are from the competition. At that time, it was we thought of it being a steel construction. Um, as it turns out, this also is a pre development <laughs> project in the end. Uh, the obvious thing here was that you could actually produce uh, a steel construction in Poland and ship it directly to uh, to the harbor side. This is a, an image from the competition, and uh, this is the image from the finished. <clears throat> okay, so this is the story about the iceberg. Most people think that the iceberg is a, is a building that, that was were, were designed to look like an iceberg. But it basically, it, it was designed to give the best views to the ocean side. It was designed to have good daylight conditions uh, for everybody. It was designed to uh, have a big diversity in, uh, in, uh, in uh, apartments and not an iceberg. The iceberg was what we dubbed it when we uh, turned in the competition and uh, therefore we also sort of took the name and developed it further into the design after we won the competition. Uh, but basically uh, the whole design is uh, consisting of this figure that is repeated over and over again. It's offset it's cut by the side perimeter. So basically, it's um, a repetitive structure, which means that it allows uh, to have a cost price which is very, very low. It was conceived as social housing, uh, two thir one third and one two thirds private housing in combination. Uh, so there was a social housing organization in this uh, as a developer uh, as well. So that means when you have social housing, there's a, a, lot, uh, a bar that is the maximum, which is um, it's the same as uh, 24, it's something like uh, $4,500 per square meter. But that includes the cost for, for the uh, site. It includes uh, all the uh, salaries. It includes uh, VAT, which is 25%. So you can imagine, in this case here, you are making a building that is around uh, $2,000 a uh, square meter, which is, what, 200, yeah, I think it's even lower than that. It's a, it's a, this, is, this is really low priced as well. Okay, so as you can see, um, down here, it's, 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 it's like, an, uh, like an arrow here. Yeah meaning that this area is like a road house. You enter through from, this, from, from the, the street into this one here. Up here, you start to have flats, small flats, and then gradually you go up to these double height uh, uh, apartments on the top. So it has a wide range of uh, different uh, apartments. This is the building surrounded by, uh, by water, these channels here, cut out. This is the ocean side. What? Denmark. In Aarhus. Uh, it's actually our hometown. hometown. Um, so these are some renderings from uh, actually the composition stage. I was supposed to download some, uh, some images we just got from the site. This shows a little bit about it. As you can see, um, it looks like there's a lot of repetitive stuff going on. That was actually the rational part of the project. 
But in reality, there was only two uh, concrete elements that were the same in the whole project. There's a lot of diff uh, same kinds of windows that could come the cost, but the, the uh, concrete elements uh, were all different. Uh, and you can see this is a fold out uh, facade. And you can see that the figure that you saw before is actually repeated and then just cut at the edges. So they started building a uh, small building first in order to uh, get all the errors uh, and, and uh, do it as a sort of like a prototype building. Uh, but there was also another thing that uh, we had to deal with was how to actually put on the roof because uh, there's a really strict law uh, for working environment in Denmark. And uh, these type of, type of roofs, um, they hadn't seen uh, such big sloping uh, faces before. So um, they needed to uh, bring in um, people like this, who are actually mountaineers. Uh, so we have videos where we actually have mountaineers rappelling on, a, on a, the roof uh, and bringing in the plates uh, and, um, and, and mounting them. These are the guys who, uh, who are setting up the uh, balconies. Uh, the concept for the balconies was that you had um, dark blue at the bottom that gradually faded towards white uh, on the top. It's pretty interesting uh, when the sun comes around during the day. Um, it's some have, have, have this kaleidoscopic uh, feeling to it because it reflects uh, uh, the glass, the blue glass. <coughs> so it's, it's, it's really beautiful. So what does this image say to you? I, I remember Leonardo DiCaprio movie. Uh, yeah, exactly right. Um, so we have these ocean liners coming in, and uh, when they're sort of passing the iceberg, we have this titanic uh, kind of uh, moment uh, in the harbor, uh, which is pretty fun. But it's, it tells a little bit about the scale, obviously. Another thing that is interesting is that when we talked about the deep skyline as being a design parameter, in order not to have just a facade facing the arrival from the ocean side, you can actually see here that the different facets of the uh, building catches the sunlight, and it's the most lit building in the whole city. So it's the first building you actually see when you arrive from the, from the ocean side. And here you can see the vast scale on the other side of the, of the, the harbor. Okay. This one I'm just going to uh, show, uh, it's right next to it. It's a um, student dorm. It's a really low cost building as well. Uh, it's a combination of actually something where we try to uh, combine the uh, books and uh, Manhattan into one building, breaking down scale uh, by actually making sort of like a big shelf of Manhattan. It's a Manhattan building because we uh, take each uh, um, uh, room and make it a tower and then we put them together. We add a different kind of material to each uh, to each uh, apartment or, or, or uh, room in the building as well. So you can see here's the floor plan. Uh, these ones out here are for couples. They are they all different small uh, units, with different kinds of facades as well. So here the idea is actually instead of having the, the usual slab where you have a, a corridor in the center, we try to flip it up vertically and then make a vertical shaft so people meet each other instead of uh, living on different uh, floors. We have a visual connection when they uh, exit of their doors. And in order to enhance that, we introduce uh, into this the shaft here, which is very, very narrow. Uh, you can see the materials here on the side of the side. We introduce uh, mirrors on the front. So it's like a, 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 a street mirror which we have in Denmark. Old people used to sit in the, in the windows and then they can look up and down the street. So this is the same thing. We just have the possibility of looking uh, uh, and, and see the people who are right underneath you. 
So you see, this very, very narrow shaft also brings light directly into the center of the building and all the way down to, uh, to the bottom of the, of the building. So it's also one of those cheap tricks to do. This material is actually cheaper than uh, to, to, to make a cast, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, fence? fence? Rain, and, yeah, rain. I think there's actually some of the people, some of you see this guy here, it's the same guy over here, over here, over here. So we, if you are, if you're one person in the space, there's unlimited people in the space. If you're two, you're two times unlimited. Um, but it actually works. Uh, people are standing here and talking to people underneath them and looking into the mirror on the opposite side. Uh, and that's pretty cool. Um, and you have this uh, effect of like a kaleidoscopic uh, space. Um, so it's really a cheap trick, and yet, as you can see, it's what we do a lot about is about cheap tricks. Actually, uh, trying to incorporate them the most, get the most out of nothing, basically. And uh, well, we did typography for this one as well. This is for showing uh, where uh, the different uh, rooms are, where people live, um, as you can see here. One thing that we forgot is that people use doormats as well. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Next time we'll, we'll put the uh, number somewhere else. Okay, that was it. Um, I uh, have a, a QR code here. We usually do a publication every fifth year. We find out that, that uh, the stuff we do after fifth year, five years, seems like a million years ago. So we start to break them into smaller booklets as well. And um, this one here is an online version. Uh, if you Take a photo of this one or scan this one, you, you can see a lot of projects um, and uh, you can download it for free. Great. That was uh, the last uh, slide. Communication uh, or developing concepts, we draw a lot by hand actually. Uh, it's a really fast medium. Uh, when you're talking while sketching, it's, it's how to get your point through. Uh, so, as you can see, there's also traces of uh, actually hand drawings in some of our presentation material. We take it uh, all the way to the, the, when we're doing the final project, actually. Also, some of the uh, the drawings for the working documents we do by hand. Uh, it's because, um, well, for um, for presentation, it's sort of like an invitation. It's not as a closed kind of um, uh, way of communicating. It seems like it's open for inter interpretation, and that way it sort of uh, activates the receiver uh, uh, fancy in a, in a different way. Um, so when we do the diagrams, uh, also the ones that are the illustrated are, uh, as you can see, we spend a lot of time um, uh, discussing uh, the narrative. We consider it actually as infographics. Uh, it needs to be pretty sharp uh, because it needs to um, go hand in hand with the uh, uh, well, the grand narrative, with the idea. Uh, we work a lot with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, 
this is probably heading into another discussion, I guess, you know, now, because this is going to probably be interesting. That, you know, there's, there's, um, for all of the stuff we do, even though they have clear concept, there's a, there's a huge amount of research uh, done beforehand. So it's not something that comes uh, as a sudden inspiration. And uh, therefore, uh, all those, all that matter, all that subject matter that is incorporated into the project uh, starts to uh, to uh, guide you into asking the right question. Um, we think that uh, we have to find uh, the right question in order to create the right solutions uh, for the project. So therefore, um, all of this research uh, sort of fuels uh, the solution, and that's part of uh, sort of creating the philosophy because. There's different circumstances uh, for each project. Um, it can be uh, the type of building, it can be the, the economy, it can be the function, and so on. Uh, and we're not trying to sort of pull a, a signature language onto uh, our building. We are trying to see what suits the building the most and, and fulfills the program. So I think that's that's the way that we try to sort of go bottom up in the research and trying to develop the building. As you can see, for instance, with the ECEC, um, it's done by research of uh, actually f cultural anchors at the site. It's a, a program that is developed from scratch. We didn't have anything, but we still had to make a huge um, uh, change of how we usually uh, to uh, kindergartens where you have the teacher space located inside the classroom. Here it's sort of like combined in, uh, uh, split into two uh, floors, but that's what makes it possible to actually fit the building onto the side, makes a more integrated uh, educational facility and also a more uh, sort of a clean play uh, area on, uh, on the, the ground level. So I don't know, I, I think that's sort of maybe um, answers your question. Uh, that's an example of how we did it. Uh, yeah. hmm? how, we, how we work? Uh, usually fight a lot. <laughs> the good, good thing about being free is always there's two that agree and one that doesn't. <laughs> uh, so, and um, usually it changes a lot because um, there's different levels in, in, in a studio. Something has to do with the conceptualization of the project. Uh, some has to do with project leading. Some has to do with the administra administration of the office and so on. Uh, marketing, blah blah and so on. There's good cop and bad cops. There's uh, the, the, the uh, what's it called? Uh, the ugly, the, uh, the good bang, the ugly. Yeah. Uh, and we usually change that role. So it's not like there's a, there's one person who's 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 a, who's a pillar? Who's a bad guy? And one is a good guy. It always uh, sort of um, changes uh, uh, during project. So, uh, but we usually are always we always two per two per persons on a project, and um, that is more. That's that's the reason is why that we want to sort of. Um, it's both there's a backup function in it, but there's also a sh sharing of knowledge, sharing of experience. Uh, it's also a way to sort of um, to have a discourse uh, in the studio. You have someone to uh, to discuss with, and, and and then automatically, even though you're not on on maybe another project, you're influencing that project through that second person. Uh, so it's just a part of the structure. I studied uh, architecture and when I was doing my thesis, uh, Miguel and Collier were already uh, architects. Uh, they were, uh, I think, one and a half year ahead of me. By then I already knew that we were going to start an office. So if I, if, if I weren't going to start an office at that time, I would have been, hopefully been in the States because um, that was the place I aspired to. Um, 
So, the thing that is interesting is that uh, the studios that are at our age in Denmark, uh, most of them actually went to uh, the Netherlands. Um, we went to the States, and uh, Mikkel went to, to Peter Wilson in Münster. Um, I think Peter Wilson liked Neil's stuff, and Neil liked Peter Wilson's stuff. Hello? Yeah. Uh, so we 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 sort of we did we didn't take the Dutch theme at the time. Uh, so we sort of have um, a different uh, influence in in, in our uh, studio. And uh, I think what you can see is that um, even though we have a very uh, sort of pragmatic side, we also have a very artistic side uh, where we allow ourselves to uh, to express what we consider being the right solution without always argumenting uh, for it. Um, I think that we've always been insisting on building, and through building, gaining a lot of experience, uh, and through that experience, having a, an intuition that sort of uh, allows us to, uh, to take certain decisions uh, from, from what we know and what we, we, what we feel could be the right solutions. The research material, on the other hand, uh, is something that we sort of feel that we obligated in, in sort of um, uh, fulfilling by doing uh, or making things work. Uh, when, if you look at our plans uh, in our schools, um, they are highly developed. They, they are there's no flaws actually. That's that's our sort of um, uh, trademark. Uh, there's no waste of uh, floor areas or something like that. It's it's like using every bit of resource. Uh, so we're trying to combine the sort of rational, uh, programmatic way of, of doing things that is sort of like a, a craft with, with sort of a more um, artistic approach as well. And I think that the states, yeah, and the pragmatic from the Netherlands, yeah. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> Sebra, Sebra and Plot started out at the same time, 2001. And at that time, um, uh, we were the first offices to start out uh, for 10, 15 years. So there's a huge gap between already established offices and, and there's a, like a vacuum. Room. Young offices um, at the time. Uh, it was a little Dutch as well. It was Bill Arts. Uh, it was more about doing uh, cool, clean boxes um, and where the detail were more in, in the finishing and in the material rather than the uh, quality of the spaces. Uh, so that was a, a window of opportunity, actually. So when we started the office, uh, we started on one commission, um, which sort of stopped two weeks after we started. And then, uh, well, then we have the uh, .com, uh, which the, the first of the, the IT bubble then, and after that, 9-11. Uh, so we started down in, in like an economical crisis. So it actually could only get better. Uh, but it was also very easy so, to start up because if you just painted something uh, red or orange, everybody would scream or, or even come up and, with an applause because everything was become too much or almost too perfect in being refined in a way that it, 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 uh, it would become tedious. We had a tradition of, um, of modernist architects that we just kept on reiterating on top of, but without making any critical uh, adjustments to any agenda. So, by having this uh, window of opportunity, uh, it meant that uh, we actually, actually had a possibility of, 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 of uh, being heard, because we, we, uh, we had the 
the opportunity of, uh, of, of giving a sound alternative. Uh, and we also um, had a huge interest in, in uh, actually a, a humanistic approach, where it was also about making the architecture come alive again, uh, rather than only dealing with the, the um, entrepreneurial boxes. Um, the climate today, uh, if you take three times Nelson, Smith Hammer Larsen, and uh, C.F. Miller, and Henny Larsen, and those, um, I think that the young studios have actually uh, been very good for those offices. They already had a huge international potential, but not all of them were actually doing stuff outside Denmark at the time. So it's like small creatures coming up from underneath, and uh, you know, then you really have to sort of make an effort to to to, to do something else. So I think they it, it, it helped them change as well. So as you can see, three times mills today they're doing radically different architecture than they, than they did at that time. Today they're doing parametric design and so on. Right? So. It's, it's definitely changed a lot. Last word, thanks. Uh, that was amazing. We learned a lot. Um, so you're a pragmatic person, and we're artists, and um, <laughs> we all want to be the same, which is both. And uh, that was a good lesson tonight. Thanks, Carson, very much. You know, you know Neil. Um, yeah, I do. Because I, I saved this one actually. Because I, I didn't want to show it, because then you would have asked some different questions. der ligesom i plan ligner det her øh, snit nu. Øh, det vil sige, at den beskriver sådan set øh, en cirkel. Og diameteren på den cirkel er 700 meter. Det vil sige, at den enkelte bue spænder over øh, 700 meter. Den øverste af den, øh, som ligesom bærer blandt andet også de to andre, der er støttet i to andre under den, den er 110 meter øh, på det øverste punkt. Det vil sige, at det er et meget markant øh, landmark, der kan konkurrere med, med f.eks. høje huse, som man, som man bygger øh, i andre byer. Og så har vi sammenlagt, når man regner hoteldelen med, øh, shoppingdelen med, og øh, restauranten har haft en skæring så har vi omkring, at vi har over øh, 70.000 øh, forlagt. Skidåben øh, Danmark er lavet til alle folk, der elsker skidløbet. Det er alt lige fra børnefamilier til, til unge par og til, til pensionistforeninger, skiklubber og så videre, som elsker skiløbet. Vi ser også en stor mulighed i at, 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 sige, at, at lære fra os af skiløbet til folk, som ikke har prøvet at være på skifør før. Og det er selvfølgelig måske en af vores aller, aller største passioner, det er at give, give glæden med skiløbet videre til folk, der ikke har prøvet det før. Og det får vi lige pludselig muligheden for med, med skiløbet i Danmark. Vi, vi får folk klædt på til at kunne stå på ski og sende den ned på ferie i, i Alperen. Vi kan, vi kan give noget til Randers, øh, som, som er ekstra selvfølgelig med, med infrastrukturen, at man binder de to dele sammen. Men det er også sådan, at selv uden for skidåbens åbningstider, så har man mulighed for at bruge tagfladen. Vi har jo som sagt tre buer, øh, der i alt skaber de seks arme i snedflukket. Den øverste bue, det er skisportsted med sådan nogle børster. Altså indvendigt har vi jo ægte sne, men det er sådan nogle børster, som gør, at man også kan stå på ski i, om sommeren. Så har vi en bue med et uh, hårdt landskab af beton, som man kan bruge til streetkultur, uh, altså streetaktiviteter, til skateboard, uh, BMX, roleskøjt og den slags ting. Og så har vi en blød overflade, som er en rekreativ uh, rute, som man bare kan gå tur på, eller kan spille bold på, eller lidt ned ad sol på. Altså i virkeligheden en slags uh, græsplæne, der bare uh, spænder hen uh, over gud enormt.
guess what that was? <laughs> yeah. That was a that was a viral commercial for a, for a skin company. <laughs> It has it had uh, 120,000 hits on YouTube. Yeah. The people in this city believe it actually, um, and and what you can see is actually that this, these bridges are bridging a river, so it's connecting different sides of uh, the city. But but it's it's monstrous. So, uh, but what what we were amazed was that they didn't complain about it because uh, they, 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 the city people said, wow. Finally, something is coming to a small city. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you can see the small buildings outside, right next to it. Yeah. All right. Thanks.